Well, hello everyone. Happy Monday, a new week. New week again here in Ottawa at the Emergencies Act inquiry with the Public Order Emergency Commission. I'm here with Celine Gallas, my fe fellow fellow Rebel News colleague. I'm also <laughs> here with the great Eva, Eva Chipiuk, lawyer for the Freedom Convoy. How are you doing, Eva? Thank you. I'm doing very well. Nice to be here. Yes, yeah, nice to have you on again. And later on, we will also have uh, Freedom Convoy lawyer Keith Wilson as well join us on the show. So today, um, just a quick rundown, super quick, and I have a little bit of housekeeping to do right before we get to the action itself. Um, we saw some pretty interesting, surprisingly, testimonies. Even though the crowd was the crowd was pretty was pretty empty, the room was empty. There weren't a lot of people. It was a pretty relaxed and calm day. Yes. But some interesting stuff still came out. So today we saw uh, Mayor of Windsor Andrew Dilkin. Uh, testify in front of the commission, as well as Chief Deputy Jason Crawley from the Windsor Police Services. Um, so yeah, so throughout the live stream, if you guys want to communicate with us, you can always head on to Odyssey or Rumble and say that, send us a paid chat that we will do our best to read on air towards the end of the live stream. Um, also, we have an event in Toronto on November 19th and one in Calgary on November 25th. It is called the Rebel News Live Event, where well, you will be able to meet uh, other Rebel News uh, people, such as myself, Celine Gallus. And we will also have Tamara Leach come to both events to give a speech. So if you guys want to meet Freedom Convoy leader herself, Tamara Leach, though she doesn't call herself a leader, um, Freedom Convoy leader herself, Tamara Leach, Pastor Archer Pavlovsky, uh, Andrew Lawson, lawyer uh, Alan Honor. You can always head on to rebelnewslive.com and there you will be able to buy a ticket for yourself. All right, let's get to it. So Celine, today you live tweeted the whole day from mm -hmm. the commission. Mm -hmm. um, what were your general impressions? Well, um, just like we saw last weekend, uh, any of the lawyers that are maybe anti-convoy is a little bit too strong, but we'll call it what it is. The narrative seems to be very similar week to week with what uh, with what they get when they go up and they actually are asking these witnesses questions. So it's kind of like a poultice is what I'm referring to. Whatever they get from them is usually a part of the same narrative. Not much new information comes into play until we have the convoy organizer lawyers that go up to the stand and they actually cross-examine these witnesses. That is usually when I find I get the most out of my day and uh, those tweets also get uh, the most um, optics, impressions. Yeah. yeah. Of course, always great to hear... Uh... Brendan Miller and Bathsheba Miller Bandenberg. time. Yeah, yeah. cross-examine the witnesses, <laughs> as well yeah. as the GCCF and TDF uh, lawyers Absolutely, as well. Absolutely, yeah. Eva, your thoughts from today's testimonies that we've heard? Well, I just wanted to say that I feel the same way with some of the questions that we've been hearing from other counsel is I do really find, as you were saying, Celine, that when um, Brendan Miller goes up, he really gets to the heart of why we are all here, What, whether or not it was justified to enact the Emergencies Act. We really see him zeroing in on that particular issue. And today, I know uh, we were going to talk about this, so I'll just jump right into it, is a Brendan Miller put to the mayor from Windsor mm -hmm. a document. That's from right. CSIS. Yeah. So if we're going to be talking about the Emergencies Act, if we're going to be talking about whether there was a national security threat, who are we going to be asking the question of? It's CSIS. That's the federal, you know, intelligence yes, department. Exactly. Yeah. So he brought that up. And what did it say on February 13th? Is it said, our recommendation is not to invoke the Emergencies Act because that will actually, in my words, in my summary, cause more harm yeah. than good. Yeah. He was concerned that it would elicit more extremist views and more violence because people were concerned about the breakdown with, uh, with the system and the government. So you see that kind of evidence come through and it's nobody else is talking about it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I know that I saw that CTV had uh, edited one of their articles and, and kind of posted about it afterwards, after the fact, right? But I think being in that room, like, that was so significant. I was, I mean, it, like, you know, it kind of comes with the Miller brand, you know, whenever he goes up there, I'm a little bit in shock. I never know what's gonna, what's gonna happen. He just zeroes in, like you said, and then it's like, bam, it's yeah. Miller time, closes his notebook, he says, thank you. And then he just goes and it's fantastic every time so mm -hmm. this was significant and you're right not enough people are talking about that yet it says it point blank and that's something that's been missing yeah well let's take a look at the document itself if we could show it once again on the screen yeah, if you definitely. could just do a little rundown of the document so what 
what should we get what should we understand from this um so the significant point that i was referring to and that brendan miller actually what he did was he read it um into the record so <laughs> it was the third uh, bullet point there and there's no way i could read it from here on the screen but you could see it's this is CSIS notes and it's dated february 13th and basically it says similar to what i said is that um and I guess everyone can read it for themselves. Yeah. But um, in, invoking the Emergencies Act can cause more harm with increased violence and in increased extremist mm -hmm. views. Yeah. So, you know, you look at something like that, you're getting that straight from the top, yeah. and you question immediately why the next day. Yeah the federal government invoke the Emergencies Act. Who are they listening to? Yeah, exactly. And tying that into Crowley's uh, testimony afterwards, uh, just to jump ahead a little bit, just to get to this point, he, he said actually twice, I remember, that he was not sure if it was necessary mm -hmm. to invoke it in the end, based on the rest of his testimony. So even with them invoking it, and we saw what happened in Ottawa, we saw what happened in uh, Windsor, Ontario at that blockade, still, Deputy Chief James, uh, Jason Crowley said that it was, he implied it was not necessary. And he said that multiple times through his testimony. I actually didn't mind listening to his testimony. It was not the worst. That's not even the first time that we hear that. So sure. a little while ago, we heard that the OPP officer, I believe it was Marcel Baudin, might be him, mm. might be another person who gave a document to the federal government, to the federal cabinet, suggesting that they should negotiate with the protester instead of invoking the Emergencies Act. Yeah. The cabinet... Uh, at that same meeting where they where they invoke the act, took a look at the document, threw it away, and decided to invoke the Emergencies Act anyway. It's not the first time that we hear the police say something mm -hmm. to the federal the federal government and the federal government doing the exact opposite. The second time, I believe, at least. Yeah. Well, I, I unless I completely missed it, but I have not heard one witness thus far say that it was something we needed and it was something that we used the Emergencies Act. Necessary. Yeah. Yes. And what's really important from what we've heard today is today it was just Windsor about Windsor one hundred percent. So yeah. it was the mayor of Windsor and um, the chief of police. I think is his yeah. role WPS. for Windsor. Yeah. And both witnesses, you know, what really stood out and what you, everyone in Canada needs to be reminded of is the blockades that were there were already gone before the Emergencies Act was invoked. So how could either of these witnesses say that's something we needed, that's mm -hmm. something we asked for when the blockades, uh, the protest yeah. was already gone? Yeah. I want to talk about the the part. I'm not sure if we have any clips from that yet from the day, but specifically when they were mentioning, again, jumping ahead a little bit, but this part really stood out to me and it bothered me, is uh, all the claims that the protesters were using children, physically oh. using children as body shields. So I mean, like mm -hmm. physically picking up your child and being like, you can't hurt me and just like having them between the police lines. Um Crowley towards the end said, he did say this. Um, he said that when asked by Miller, I need to find that clip by Miller. He said, well, it was enough hard evidence mm -hmm. for me when I saw um, children standing in a line and like holding hands, like that was enough for me to believe the claims and you know what the misinformation from the, the mainstream media and the other police reports, it's just a bunch of hearsay. Mm -hmm. well, yeah, well, let, but before, before yeah. we continue, we've been talking for a little while yet. Yeah. Let's take a look at that clip so that everyone can see yes, what, the, what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Confirmation bias. Strategic analysis must be driven by Millet. direct evidence collection <laughs> and assessment as opposed to reliance on social media posting as it lacks context and where the poster's uh, bias may not be considered. Would you agree with that? Uh, potentially, yes, but I can say that, like I said, I don't even think I saw this, but yeah. when it talks about real evidence, when I heard the protesters themselves on the, the open chat talking about human shields, children as human shields, and seeing a picture with children holding hands across the intersection at here in church and college in the early stages, uh, that's hard evidence for me. Okay. And of course, you followed up on investigating that and making sure that, you know, that wasn't an issue? Our special invest investigations unit was definitely involved, and they they interview the um, they deal with the children, the crimes against children, along with CAS for sure. Okay, and you can agree there that the report there from the 12th from OPP says no persons were observed outside. Uh, there was no children were observed, but believed to be inside a camper. Uh, if we can scroll down, 
only Canadian flags observed. That's it. So you can agree based on that report, as of the 12th, according to the OPP, uh, that wasn't really an issue. Not at this time, for right. sure. And again, we, you agree possibly with what I said to you with respect uh, to essentially the validity of relying on social media alone, right? We did not rely on the loan, but I would agree with that. You cannot rely on a loan, yes. Thank you. Thank you. So if I could jump into this um, right away is uh, let's talk about evidence for a second. So mm -hmm. that's something, you know, we've talked a lot about. You mentioned hearsay. Yeah. Um, and I would love if somebody could put up on the screen what the what the Facebook post was. Okay, so um, we, we can't do that right now. So I'll encourage you just to watch. <laughs> so what the question was right before is you would see the document and this was brought up by the federal government. Mm -hmm. So they brought up, they called them tweets. If you actually look at the it's evidence, it was a Facebook post. So they didn't <laughs> even get the source correct, which is nice. not great. Yeah. Um, and then what it was is just unidentified and uh, Brendan Miller confirmed that in the cross-examination just before this clip started, yeah. is he said, do you know who this person is? Yeah. Was this person identified? Were they even in Windsor? Do you have any information to corroborate what is said? And if you look at that post, the words aren't even spelled correctly. Yeah. So this is what the federal government was using to put to um, this, you know, chief of police yeah. about human shields that's the evidence they yeah. brought unidentified uh uncertain who where what when how mm -hmm. then you go down one two pages to an opp intelligence report yeah. and you saw right there it said no children were observed so we have the government of canada yeah using a facebook post by some unidentified person versus opp intelligence information so even going back to our discussion before about credible CSIS information not being yeah. used here we have credible opp inform intelligence mm -hmm. information not yeah. being used rather we're the government is looking at a facebook comment mm -hmm. it's really incredible isn't it like when you when you break it down and thank you so much for bringing more context to this because i think this is such an important uh, part of uh, the testimonies from today <laughs> children mm -hmm. like uh, just the narrative again it's it's very similar to what we're seeing they continue to paint the narrative as if these protesters are these dangerous very very violent people so to the point that they would use their own children as a uh, body shields to deter police from taking action again like you already reiterated and we saw today um that blockade was disassembled even before the emergencies act was evoked um and there were no children that were reported, except for some that were within a camper, safe, warm, mm -hmm. and with their families, I would assume. So yeah. really incredulous, really yeah. <laughs> riveting. Really yeah. hard to watch when mm -hmm. you see, you actually look at the evidence that yeah. is being used to justify anything. You know, the evidence is not a Facebook comment. No, yeah. goodness, I would hope not. <laughs> In that case, I've got a lot of evidence for some cases myself. My goodness, <laughs> check those comment sections, you know? <laughs> it's got to be truth. All right, well, thanks so much for joining us. Uh, Eva, I know that you have to go somewhere with uh, some other people tonight to a certain <laughs> She's event. very popular. <laughs> yeah, at a, at a certain location if you're in Ottawa. So thanks so much for your time. I look forward to seeing you, seeing you again thanks soon. Thanks for coming right. on. Thanks Let's for go on a me. quick ad break, and then when we come back, we will have Freedom Convoy lawyer Keith Wilson come on. Freedom in 2022 is your right to disagree with me anytime on anything in your heart, online, or in the public square. Freedom in 2022 is also your right to live your life however you see fit without hurting me or for that matter being bothered by me. But freedom in 2022 is in very real danger under constant attack by Justin Trudeau through his censorship bills, his attacks on gun rights, his attacks on farmers, and his attacks on peaceful protesters. These people have even tried to denormalize our flag. 
At Rebel News, we're not afraid to have dangerous discussions that Justin Trudeau, the media and big tech censors say we're not allowed to have. And we want to have them with you at our upcoming Rebel Live events, first in Toronto, November 19th, and again in Calgary, Saturday, November 26. I'll be there with dozens of other rebels and rebel adjacent free thinkers, and I hope that you'll join us. Just go to rebelnewslive.com to get your tickets today, but do not sleep on this because these tickets are going fast. See you soon. Freedom in 2022 is a great threat in Canada. We've got provincial governments that have stripped away fundamental human and civil liberties in Canada. And we've got a federal government that is censoring and controlling the media and even cracking down on the right to protest in ways that are unprecedented in the post-war era. Oh my God. Oh my God. It's a fascinating but terrifying time if you're concerned about freedom, concerned about your basic liberties right now. But we've got to do more than just complain about it. That's why I've accepted the invitation to speak at the Rebel Live conference in Calgary, November 26, coming right up here. I'm going to be speaking in particular about the state of the media. It's controlled by the federal government and what independent media can do to hold power to account, to stand up for our basic freedoms. I'm going to be there. I hope you'll come. Uh, you can buy your tickets at rebelnewslive.com. And uh, I hope to see you there. All right, welcome back, everyone. Once again, if you want to go to the Rebel News live event where I will be there and Celine will be there as well and a lot of other people, interesting people as you just on screen will be there. Uh, you can always head on to rebelnewslive.com and you can buy your tickets there. All right, we have on with us Keith Wilson, lawyer for uh, Freedom Corp. How are you doing, Keith? I'm doing great. How are you? Good, good. It was a slower day yesterday. I saw, yeah, you guys came in there later, later during the day of the commission. Well... You know, we've transitioned now from having the police witnesses, the municipal witnesses, and then mm -hmm. the Freedom Convoy folks themselves. Mm -hmm. And we're now in this um, almost sidebar dealing with the border protests with mm -hmm. Coots and Windsor. So um, uh, I think we all expected it to be a little bit slower. Mm -hmm. um, we're always working on what we need to do three days ahead of time all the parties are because we have to disclose all the documents that we're going to be cross-examining on uh, we get our time allocations for cross and so um even if the day itself seems a little slower it doesn't mean back at hq things are very slow <laughs> and what so we know that we have the windsor protesters right now we also have the coots protesters uh what do you think were we can expect to see come out from their testimonies. Well, I think, uh, um, you know, I think the, the, the events at Coots and Windsor were resolved prior to Trudeau mm -hmm. deciding to yes. invoke the Emergencies Act. And that's what's absolutely critical. The only protest or event that was still occurring in Canada when Trudeau and his cabinet made the decision was the protests in Ottawa, which we were in the process of implementing a de-escalation deal with the mayor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So um, it's difficult for the government to redeem itself by saying, oh, look at the bad things that were happening at Windsor. Look at the bad things that were happening at Coots because they were all over. Yeah. What uh does happen though is because these uh, the RCMP involved in Coots are a party to this, they had to disclose hundreds, in some instances thousands, and we literally are well over 50,000 documents in terms of pages now. So we okay. data mine through those, and we come across documents, as you saw today, <laughs> with the CSIS briefing that briefed the cabinet on three different instances mm -hmm. and basically said, uh, not only do you should you not be invoking the Emergencies Act, you don't have what it takes, but it's actually a bad idea. Yeah. And in face of that, our our um, our Prime Minister, who has demonstrated very thin skin and in an inability to withstand any kind of criticism, decided to proceed with invoking it to give him the excuse to bring in 
police with sticks and clubs mm -hmm. and tear gas and and uh, don't forget other, the right horses let's not forget and, those. And the horses oh, yeah. to trample crazy. to trample canadians rights yeah. both physically and uh legally yeah yeah no of course all right so we've spoken a little bit about mayor dilkin's testimony we've also spoken about um the the the, the windsor police services officer's testimony let's take a look at clip number one Let's take a look at part of uh, Mayor Dilkin's testimony where he talks about um, the fact that, in his view, the nature of the protests uh, were unprecedented. Take a look at that. But it was just, it was, it was the, the nature and sort of the spirit of the protest. It was unlike anything I've ever seen. You know, I've lived my whole life in the city of Windsor. It's unlike anything I've ever seen during that time. Uh, and the, the posture and the language was, you know, it was, it was, almost as if folks wanted some sort of brawl on the streets. You know, they were hoping police would engage in that way so they could have some sort of, you know, brawl on the streets, if I can describe it that way. Yeah. How'd you make it, Vesely? I mean, I tried not to laugh while I heard it in the media room. Like I, I did my best because again, it's the, it's the same painting them as these violent people. I mean, if hot tubs and bouncy castles are, they emit the atmosphere of brawl like or bar fight ish, whatever is synonymous to feeling the, the, the tensions in a room or in a place where you would consider it to be so dangerous that you anticipate a brawl or you, people are, it just doesn't make sense to me. Again, I was at these places. Like I, I was at these places. It's enough said for me. Just yeah. no. I mean, I don't think the mayor of Windsor, this mayor, could be mayor of Ottawa if he thinks that this is a huge protest. I mean, <laughs> Ottawa would get things as big as this often. He, the, Windsor wasn't the place where the convoy was at the end. Yeah. Of the, that was Ottawa. So yeah. What What are your thoughts on his uh, on his comments? Well, I've got two thoughts. I mean, the first is one of the concerns at all times while I was here in Ottawa and the lead volunteers here in Ottawa was about the truckers keeping their cool. Mm -hmm. You know, Jordan Peterson talked about the truckers keeping their cool. Tucker Carlson talked about the truckers keeping their cool. Um, uh, and so many others. And that was one of the things that really impressed me about the protesters here in Ottawa yeah. is how they were acutely aware that what the prime minister and some of the police wanted was exactly that. Yeah. If they wanted to start a brawl, they would have started. Oh, for sure. They could have. It, it took a lot of energy <laughs> yeah. and effort. And it was remarkable. The yes. absence of any form of violence, the low statistics on crime compared to any other gathering of anything close to this scale or even a fraction of it. For sure. So that's one point. The other point, though, is, um, and it's a really important one, and it's this, the reason why these protests occurred the reason why so many Canadians came out at all these different places was never before in the history of our country did they have governments impose themselves with restrictions on the most basic human rights, fundamental liberties, basic liberties. Never before did Canadians experience playgrounds and uh, outdoor hockey rinks um, uh, cordoned off with police tape yeah, that's and, right. and teenagers being wrestled to the ground because they had the audacity to be out getting some exercise and playing some hockey. And never before did government think it was a good idea to tell us that we couldn't be with our families at Christmas and at birthdays and at anniversaries and at Thanksgiving or be at the side of a dying loved one yeah. or help and care for someone after they got discharged from hospital or travel across the country. I could keep going. We cannot <laughs> lose sight of how fundamentally far this government and the provincial governments overstepped and overreacted and the harm that they've done. And that's why we're here in this inquiry yeah. and it's going to keep coming out. Yeah. I was really pleased with um, all of the witnesses last week telling their stories yeah. and, and explaining how it had hurt them and their children and their neighbors and their communities. So um, there should be no surprise by any elected official, whether it's the mayor of Windsor or anyone else, as to why there was an unprecedented protest. It's because there was an unprecedented overreach in the most un-Canadian way imaginable by these governments. And the last holdout was Justin Trudeau. What a lot of people don't remember is the G7 countries did not have 
a restriction preventing unvaccinated from traveling within their country. Yeah. They did not do these things. Canada was an anomaly. Mm-hmm. And it was clearly, and you guys know that I'm also legal counsel to former Premier Brian Feckford on the right. charter, the, the travel mandate mm-hmm. challenge. So I had the opportunity to cross examine uh, all of the key government officials. None of them recommended the, the vaccine mandate. We've seen, we saw in that case, and we're seeing it yet again, that this is political puppeteering by the prime minister and the people around him and in his cabinet to put forward their very cynical political game. You know, I, I've got three things to say about what you just said. So first of all, you know, what's ironic is that the reason why the truckers were here is because civil liberties of Canadians, according to them, were infringed. They felt like we didn't have any civil liberties. The government wasn't respecting our charters. And what did Justin Trudeau do to get rid of the protests? And it infringe on those charter rights even more than by invoking the emergencies act that's extremely ironic to me second thing you said you also mentioned how it was tough to keep cool to, to keep the truckers calm mm-hmm. uh, during the convoy to make sure none of them get aggressive but one person who we saw wasn't able to keep his calm was glenn mcgregor when tamara leash got out of uh, of the ottawa courthouse after her that's after right. her bell hearing and the judge told her she was allowed to get off jail and visit her family once again let's take a look at how glenn mcgregor conducted conducted himself uh back in july let's take a look at that yeah you're filming this too hey yeah, yeah. <laughs> Oh, that, that's what I tweeted today because I, I saw someone retweeted this tweet from, from back from July uh, by, uh, from me. Um, I tweeted today, that's CTV's finest, Glenn McGregor. I think there's a reason why he's not the inquiry. He knows that when he sees the evidence go the wrong way, he won't be able to keep his cool. And I think this right here, just so unprofessional, and this guy pushed and there were a protester that was there. It's not the first time he did it. The first that's- time he did it was actually at the February 3rd press that's conference right. right after I'd arrived. <laughs> and as we were leaving the press conference room mm-hmm. and we went into the broader hallway, I was at the back of the group. Tamara was further up mm-hmm. with uh, Chris Barber and others. And myself and Danny Bulford were in the last of the group. That's and right. just as we were entering a stairwell, uh, Mr. McGregor, who's <clears throat> apparently acquired the nickname Punchy McGregor and <laughs> quite aptly so, Hensley came McGregor. in with both sets of elbows and elbowed myself and uh, Mr. Bulford in the chest aggressively in an effort to get in front of us to get up the stairs to go after oh. Tamara. So it's a different uh, different style. Can, it kind of yeah. reminded me of, um, you know, the old uh, WWF wrestling. You know, maybe he'd be better to go back <laughs> and right. cover that and get in the ring and throw a chair or something. It seems to be about his caliber. I think he'd be comfortable going in one of those events. That, that would be his, his environment. He'd be comfortable going there. I don't think that's the only time as well that he's tried to cause trouble, I think. Back in February, once again, he tried to get in your guys' hotel room. Go do a quick uh, interview. That, I was I've right? been pursued by Mr. McGregor into elevators and into rooms. Yes, <laughs> this he's, is uh, highly motivated. <gasps> That's unbelievable. No, it's just insane. I mean, rewatching <laughs> that footage, I'm like, you really? Mm-hmm. It's like it's a joke to me. I'm like, how can you have the audacity to do something like that? Like, you want to yeah. underline what it means to have like microaggressions. Like, you mm-hmm. see somebody and you're just immediately like <laughs> so mad that you just physically assault everyone around you. It's, yeah, it's hilarious. Like, I, what is 
is wrong with people? Seriously. I wonder if Matthew Fleury, the city councilor, <laughs> would think that's a microaggression. I think you might need to ask him in French. Matthew Fleury, pense-tu que ça c'est une microaggression? I think now he understood my question because otherwise I don't think he understands the questions out of, uh, of the people. <laughs> But there's, William. there's there's another thing as well that she said, one last thing from what she said, and it really struck it with me. Um, when the pandemic started, I was doing speed skating. I did professional. I did, I did sports for a long time. Not professional. <clears throat> Um, and we were told that we weren't allowed to practice our sport because of the pandemic. Now, I know a lot of people had meltdowns because of it. Now, I don't know a lot of people that got into depression because they weren't allowed to practice their, their sport. Yeah. And the most idiotic thing that we saw is that as a speed skating club or as a hockey club, we weren't allowed to practice, train in environment that are safe and secure but they were allowing 50 to 100 people to go on the ice with their parents just to free skate that that's an incoherent regulation that was imposed by the government well i'm sorry but you also can't forget about the case of mayor patrick brown uh from that's brampton right. i believe going and playing hockey with his buddies right. out in the rink while everyone else was absolutely in a lockdown in their house and mm -hmm. you know was prosecuted if they did anything other so mm -hmm. No, yeah, that's right. I yeah, get I, you. I get you there. Yeah, that was right. a fantastic bust this, by Menzies. Yeah, what I think this all highlights for all of us is that we probably underestimated um, and not really appreciated how important mm -hmm. being able to pursue your passions, your hobbies, uh, interacting with others is to a normal life. Yeah. You know, and when we deprive kids of their opportunity to participate in in whether it's, you know, judo or speed mm -hmm. skating or skateboarding uh, or uh, 4-H if you're on the prairies or scouts mm -hmm. and girl guides, it really has an impact. We're social beings and this myopic single focus that the health authorities had of save every senior mm -hmm. citizen at all costs, no matter how great, yeah. socially, developmentally um, um, and economically, was an absolute policy failure and the ripple effect and you even saw it mentioned in the CSIS document today is people have fundamentally lost trust in the right. institutions that they thought were what makes living in Canada a good thing everywhere from the doctors and the public health officials to the educators mm -hmm. to the um uh to the courts to the police they people never thought the police would use a lot of people never thought the police would use this level of violence on unarmed peaceful protesters. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, the good thing about this inquiry is it's forcing some of these things to come back into the discussion. Yeah. I mean, of course, the legacy media is barely covering it all. <laughs> They're just trying to keep their paymaster happy and meet payroll, um, which is unfortunate. And thank goodness <laughs> for guys like you. Well, I think that's the reason why the convoy was so big, that people were fed up with these incoherent and authoritarian policies unjustified yeah. policies yeah. that were implemented all in the name of science it was oh, a long time coming yeah, for sure have, that was a long two years yeah, you got one person the u.s was dr fauci you had one man oh, who was in control fauci. of the whole whole health establishment you had one person here to um Theresa tam who was in control of Kenyan's life it's it's absolutely unbelievable all right let's sort of throw to clip number three and afterwards we'll go on a little bit more about justin trudeau and doug ford because we saw some comments and some decisions that were taken in relation to both these men so let's stay would it be fair to say that At, at the two parts of this conversation we saw you having with Minister Mendicino, Mr. Minister Mendicino was incorrect about whether or not the Chief Mizuno had requested resources and was also incorrect as to the, the type of assistance that was offered by CVSA. I think what happened when I received that message from Minister Mendicino and my response was wrong, I called the Chief immediately uh, to make sure I understand what, understood what was going on. The chief explained to me that in a conversation that she had had with Commissioner Karik, that at that precise moment in time, they weren't asking for any more because officers were coming in and she didn't know how many officers were coming in. Understood. Okay. And it was also your understanding then that there was a plan in place as early as February 10th to dismantle this protest. Is that correct? Well, I, I knew that officers were coming in. I did not know 
the chief could not tell me how many officers were coming in, nor was I aware of how long it would take to resolve the issue. What'd you make of that, William? <laughs> well, I was about to ask you, you know, um, I, th I think all of the comments that were made today were pretty interesting. When you look at the relation between the city and the, and the police, I think as we saw from the beginning, from all the testimonies, there were some issues when it comes to coordinating oh. both the departments. I think that's an understatement that there's there were some issues, especially when they got there. Nice. <laughs> most of their not today, not today. It's been a it's been a long day. Um, yeah, I guess when you gather majority of your intelligence from mainstream media reports, um, you know, you could be discredited with what you say going after the fact that uh, both the um, uh, OPS, uh, OPP that were stationed in Ottawa all revealed that they were severely um, overwhelmed by the amount of um, protesters that actually showed up. And obviously it was the same at Windsor. And I'm going to go on a, on a limb here and say that once it gets to Coots, we're going to find that it's the same thing. Because again, when you listen to mainstream media, you're bound to get some disinformation. So uh, I'm, I'm not shocked. I'm not surprised. What do you think, Keith? Well, I, it's more of a pattern, you know, mm -hmm. that, um, th that the level of disorganization, the level of confusion, um, has been remarkable uh, at all levels. I, I think this has also um, uh, been a process of revealing <clears throat> how incompetent mm -hmm. our governments really mm -hmm. are. Imagine if this was a real threat, right? If this had been an actual threat and this is how it was dealt with when it was actually very peaceful. I'm, I'm very afraid. Uh, it's bad to say, but it, it actually worries me living in this country and, and thinking if it was an actual threat, this is how my government would have handled it. It's yeah. ridiculous. You know, it's I an embarrassment. They, I think that they had the tools and they have the they had the capacities to handle it well. Yes, for I sure. I think if we didn't have Justin Trudeau as a prime minister and a corrupt, scandal-plagued liberal cabinet running our <clears> countries, <throat> I think they would have been able to listen to the OPP and tell. I think they would have been able to open their eyes and say, yeah, let's negotiate with these truckers. There's more than a thousand of them that came to Ottawa, there must be a reason why they're here. I think if we didn't have an incompetent government in power right now, yeah. this would have been dealt a lot better than it was dealt with uh, right now. Well, yeah, because it's an understatement. Think even farther back than that. None of the draconian and unscientific um, COVID mandates would have been put into place mm -hmm. uh, provincially, federally, or uh, through That's the right. municipalities. So it's it goes so far back. It's yeah, we very... probably would have needed if you're in No, I like this. This yeah. wouldn't be happening. I guess it's kind of like, you know, all hypothetical at this point, but it's an right. interesting line of thought. I do sometimes get myself lost. And I think what it shows too is that um, very early on in the Ottawa protests, mm -hmm. there were senior officials saying, bring in an intermediary, bring in a mediator, right. bring in a negotiator. Mm -hmm. Let's open up a line of communication <clears throat> and dialogue. And that's the Canadian way of doing things. I mean, you guys are too young to remember this, but Canada was once famous for having our blue hat military, which was the peacemaker, the peacekeepers, right? right? Yeah. They would uh, wear blue helmets, rather blue, not blue hats, uh, mm -hmm. and blue bulletproof vests. And they would go to conflict zones and they would go between the parties who were warring and killing one another yeah. um, and, and try and facilitate a peaceful process. That used to be one of the things that Canada stood for. Mm -hmm. And the bureaucracy and some of the senior officials were calling on that. Um, but at every turn, the prime minister wanted no part of it. Mm -hmm. I think he was having a temper tantrum in his office and screaming at people and throwing things. There's probably a reason whenever you see a picture of his desk, there seems to be nothing on it. They probably got <laughs> tired of having things thrown at them. So they keep stuff off his desk, but, um, uh, it's clear that, uh, the adults in the room were trying to encourage the prime minister and his cabinet to take a Canadian approach and he opted not. Yeah. And uh, uh, I think we're all going to work to redefine Canada back to the Canada that we all once knew and loved. 100%. Yeah. No, I totally agree with you. All right, Doug Ford. We heard that the judge said he didn't have to appear in front of the committee, uh, in front of the commission. What do you make of that? Well, um, I hadn't studied the case law on uh the powers the limitations on the powers of the federal government to compel and subpoena a sitting uh provincial politician but um as you may have figured out that uh, brendan miller our lead barrister on the team 
is literally a walking version of uh, <laughs> legal Wikipedia. And as soon as word came out uh, that this was being challenged by Doug Ford, he turned yes. to the, the, Brendan turned to us, our legal team, and said, Ford's going to win. And the reason he said Ford was going to win is that they even cited the case off the top of his head is people probably don't notice this. Most of the time when he objects, he always cites a case right on point, you know, off the top of his head uh, when he's objecting. But uh, the case law says that um, uh, the federal government cannot compel uh, a sitting provincial member of parliament or member of a legislative assembly to a, a federal inquiry. They relied on that provision. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm not terribly surprised. But, you know, you don't, you don't have to refuse. In other words, the law doesn't say that the premier can't you know, force come. Yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah. It yeah. just says he can't be forced to come. So I don't understand why he would not have wanted to uh, make himself available. Um, politicians often tell us that they believe in transparency and openness. <laughs> and, you know, uh, showing up at a designated time at a public inquiry and being asked some questions and providing some truthful answers is a really good kind of hallmark of uh, transparency and openness. So I think uh, you said Peter it, Ford opted not yeah. to take that route. And I guess we'll never know why. You, you said it perfectly yourself. They tell us that they care about transparency. Well, Catherine McKenney told us that she cared about transparency while running away from my questions and not being able to state <laughs> a clear position on whether or not she believes freedom of speech is an important value in society. She's part of a Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms, and she wasn't able to state to the public a clear position on her views of freedom of speech. I think it shows cowardness from Ford, but I don't think it's surprising. I think it, it's it's in line with everything he's been doing for the past uh, for the past years. All right, we have you on for only a few minutes now. If you could just tell us quickly what you thought Ford could bring to the inquiry, why you thought it would be important for him to come on. And then afterwards, I think we have a chat for you and we'll let you go. Sure. After that. Well, I mean, um, the provincial government played an important role, partly because of the role of the OPP, but more importantly, um, why is it that Ford decided to declare their provincial emergency? Um, what resources was he planning to make available mm -hmm. uh, for the government to, to use? And uh, what communications did he have with the prime minister at the critical times? Yeah. So what did the prime minister know and when did he know it? Uh, so these are all important things that could have come out of if, if he had chosen mm -hmm. to uh, come forward and be transparent and, and accessible. Yeah. It would have been fun to have him on. Are you kidding? See. Of course it would have been. <laughs> see Doug Ford. All right. I think that we have a chat for Keith Wilson before we let him go. Can we, can we take a look at, uh, at that? saw one earlier all right do you want to read it sure it's yeah it's pretty small so from rumbly i rumbly. believe rumbly are the convoy lawyers going to call on the freedom doctors as witnesses to show how ridiculous the mandates were okay there's a few things there yeah one of the things that people who are watching this are struggling with because i can tell by the number of emails and messages i get every day <laughs> This is not a trial to adjudicate every aspect of what's mm -hmm. happened in our lives in the last two and a half years. That's why we don't deal with certain issues. Like um, there were some people upset with me because of some comments that were made about how the propane and fuel were stored at Coventry. Mm -hmm. it, it was stored remarkably well. It was like brilliant to how they had yeah. set up a cage system. It was just perfect. Yeah. But whether or not fuel was stored properly or improperly is irrelevant as to whether or not the conditions were present to invoke the Emergencies Act. Yes, exactly. So we're not here to adjudicate every aspect. Whether or not the mandates were medically justified, and I don't think they are, and that's the evidence that came out under oath when I cross-examined 16 federal government witnesses in the Peckford Charter Challenge, Travel Mandate Challenge, is irrelevant to whether or not the government was uh, justified in invoking the Emergencies Act and stripping Canadians mm -hmm. of their rights. So I know it's frustrating to watch. Law is a very compartmentalized process mm -hmm. and it's focused by, by design. Um, so this is not the place to adjudicate that. 
we were hoping to have that very question adjudicated by the federal court in the mm -hmm. Peckford case. Yeah, and Peckford we spent Peckford. so much time and effort and energy in getting there with our own experts and mm -hmm. 15,000 pages of evidence until the federal government brought an application to strike that on the basis of mootness. I won't go further. We can talk about that another time. <laughs> um, but the final point I was going to make on this is list of witnesses. We originally submitted a list of 23 witnesses that we expanded to 28. Okay. So we don't, we get to propose to the commission mm -hmm. people we want to testify. Yeah. And then the commission decides whether or not they're going to let them testify. Mm -hmm. So we have to triage on our list because we know we're not going to get um, all 23. And in fact, this morning, breaking news, or maybe it was this afternoon, we received an email that the commissioner has now ruled that they're not going to allow us to have any more witnesses. Wow. So everyone you've seen from our side, oh, wow. that's it. Okay. So we had some incredible witnesses on the list to testify, uh, to illuminate various aspects like former police officers who had their phones wiretapped uh, by the Ottawa City Police, um, uh, other people uh, from various ethnic backgrounds who had been brutally beaten by the police and dumped outside of town mm -hmm. uh, and others. And uh, uh, just given the schedule that the inquiry has with its hard close date of the 25th of February or of November, um, that, uh, that we, we can't just say, oh, we want this many more witnesses. We'd like to, we tried, uh, but we knew we were not going to get all 23. Uh, and then later 26, but we did get a lot of the key witnesses we wanted in. Yeah. And I, I'm super glad that you actually touched on it because that's, uh, I agree with you. A lot of people have some issues with it. It's not whether or not the mandates were justified because they weren't. It's not whether or not the convoy had, well, it was a, a good protest to have. It's not whether or not the, the freedom convoy was right, even though it was right. Even if you think that the convoy was wrong for coming to Ottawa, that's not about that. It's about whether or not it was okay for Justin Trudeau to use yeah. an anti-terrorism law that was never seen before on these law-abiding, peaceful protesters. I know I think that you that you explained it very well. Well, thanks so much for coming on, Keith. Stay stay tuned. We will go on a quick um, ad break, and then when we come back, we'll have the Democracy Fund lawyer Alan Honor join us. Stay tuned. Freedom in 2022 is not sitting idly by while health diktats with no skin in the game make up all the rules. If you're like me and want to play an active role in upholding civil liberties and freedoms for all Canadians, for our children and eventually our grandchildren, then come out to our Rebel Live event and get to know us in person we'll hearing from some of the most influential leaders in the freedom movement. We have events in Toronto on November the 19th and in Calgary on Saturday, November 26th. Tickets are on sale now at rebelnewslive.com. Come out, have lunch, get some rebel swag, meet the rebels and more. You don't want to miss this event. Check it out, rebelnewslive.com. Freedom in 2022 is certainly about being able to make free choices for ourselves and for our family, who we believe are the best. We have seen so much suffering over the last two years. People who die alone in terrible condition, people losing dream jobs, polarized families, and a society that insult and yell at each other for making a different medical choice. But people have risen, and it will be through them that the future will have an important meaning for all of you, but especially for the next generation. Ribbon News has been present at every step of this great challenge, but so many other pioneers whom you could meet and hear at our great conference about freedom for our beautiful country, which is Canada. This conference, which will be held in Calgary and Toronto, will show you the faces of the influence of freedom that you have seen over the past two years. You don't want to miss this. So get your ticket now at ribbonnewslive.com. And it will be a pleasure 
to see you there and meet you in large numbers. It's time to drop these masks and let the truth shine. All right, folks, yeah, we're having some fun at the Rebel News, Rebel News headquarters here in Ottawa. Once again, we're really pushing it hard tonight. Rebel News live events in Toronto and Calgary, <laughs> Toronto, November 19th, and Calgary on November 25th. If you want to go ahead and be able to hear from Tamara Leach, from a lot of other people. Jared Fildebrand from the Western yeah. Standard. We have Ezra Levant. We've got Sheila Gunn-Reed. Myself and William will be both be there. And then, of course, like you mentioned, Tamara Leash, yeah. not the official organizer of the convoy, but definitely one of the main faces. So go legally. buy a ticket out there. Yeah, legally. Yeah. Go buy a ticket. Yeah. Go check it out. Meet us there. And we won't be giving a speech. We're going to be there in a the crowd. Like that. So we're <laughs> yeah. going to be able to speak to you while the other ones are, are giving a yeah. speech. All right. Okay. So we have on right now Alan Honor, lead Head litigator, litig litigator I'm for the director for the <laughs> Yes, it's a pleasure to be here. Yeah, so can you tell us a little bit more about yourself? I think we don't really have you on a lot because you're off in Toronto for for so far of yours. I don't really know who you are. That's right. So um, so thank you for asking me. So I'm uh one of the lawyers at the Democracy Fund. Uh, we have party status at the uh, Public Order Emergency Inquiry. We're sharing that with our good friends at the JCCF mm -hmm. and with Citizens for Freedom. One reason you probably don't see me very often is because if one of us asks questions, then the other one is not allowed to ask questions. That's just the rules yeah, of the commission. That's right. No, that totally makes sense. And that's another thing that I was going to ask you to clarify. Um, so often the commissioner is going to call GCCF and the Democracy Fund all together. Instead, I think he got a little bit lazy. He only said the Democracy Fund and stopped saying GCCF. Is there a reason why you guys are, are together? Well, I don't, I don't think the commissioner is, is, is lazy. I think he just sometimes refers to us in a way that's convenient. That's right. We're together because we have a common interest. We're JCCF and the Democracy Fund are yeah. both civil uh, liberties organizations. Mm -hmm. They've both been involved in some way with the protesters. Mm -hmm. uh, for the Democracy Fund, we are representing a number of people who have been criminally charged. Um, we were at the Ottawa protests, giving people free advice about their charter rights yeah. and also the limits of those charter rights. For sure. We were involved uh, heavily in, in Windsor. Uh, we, had, we were friends of the court. We made submissions on the injunction that was issued there. Mm -hmm. So what were your general thoughts from today's uh, testimonies? We heard what Eva had to say, what Keith Wilson had to say. So what, what did you think? Well, you know, I haven't heard everything that Eva and Keith said, but I suspect they talked a little bit about... Um, about CSIS. They probably talked a bit about um, Trudeau invoking the Emergencies Act when CSIS suggested that maybe that's not such a good idea. <laughs> so we won't revisit that. Yeah. I think one of the interesting things that we've seen, and maybe you haven't talked about this, it, uh, came out later in the day when my colleague Anton from Citizens for Freedom yeah. uh, questioned the deputy um, OPP. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, Jason right. Crowley, yeah. And um, in, in that video, what mm -hmm. one of the things we saw was that the police uh, created an exclusion zone in Windsor. It was about a stretch of one kilometer, mm -hmm. right? And in fact, they were arresting protesters on the sidewalk if they were within that exclusion zone. That's right. And I thought that was very interesting because, mm -hmm. you know, back in February, back on February 11th and later on, on February 18th, we made submissions about this injunction, and both times we made sure that we could carve out a uh, provision mm -hmm. in that order which respected the right, the rights of protesters to peacefully protest. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Yeah, did you did you hear what he was talking about? Yeah, absolutely. I I think we might have that clip, but um, that video that was brought into evidence of that woman that was peacefully kneeling well in front of the the police lines that was on the grass. But where the sidewalks are, this was just after Crowley also said that a hundred percent, like, you know, they could peacefully protest there. It was fine. And then he has this video thrown in his face, essentially. That's like, well, you know, according to these police officers, they weren't allowed to. And according to this video, this woman that was peacefully arrested while kneeling on um, the grass again, in front of police lines, I think that was, 
I mean, it's not just hypocritical. Like it's, it's, it's very ironic for that to be brought up the way that it was. I quite enjoyed it though. Yeah. No, that was pretty interesting to, to hear about that. All right. We only have a few minutes left of the live stream. There was such an interesting live stream. Let's take a look at clip number five from, uh, well, from the commission too. Let's take a look at, let's take a look at that. The blockade on, was cleared and the bridge reopened before the emergencies act was invoked. Is that right? Uh, on the 14th so the 13th around midnight into the 14th i think the bridge opened around midnight on the 14th so the emergencies act came was invoked sometime on the 14th so yes the answer to your question is yes okay great so none of the measures in the emergencies act were used to clear the blockade since it came after correct correct okay thank you those are my questions for you necessary am i right <laughs> yeah let's make sure we get this straight so the bridge was cleared before trudeau our drama teacher invoked the emergency act that's right and actually that came out last week when we cross-examined commissioner curry yeah right it's not just windsor that was clear uh the the protest at the 402 was clear mm. the protest in cornwall was clear right the protest in windsor as we've seen was also clear uh, the protest in ottawa the police were making some progress there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we we know but we're going to hear more about coops tomorrow. Yes. Very um, excited. Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think this is actually it's an important point because when we talked about this protester earlier today who was arrested um, on the sidewalk, yeah, that actually didn't have anything to do with the Emergencies mm -hmm. Act because that protester was arrested before the mm -hmm. Emergencies Act was invoked. Mm -hmm. But it does show you something, doesn't it? It, did sh it? it shows us the attitude that some people had towards these protesters. Yeah. And I think that attitude probably informed uh, the federal government when they invoked the Emergencies Act. No, yeah. for sure. And it, you know, it, it just like you said, it's it is such a shame to see something like that take place, especially when they're told one thing and then it's the the misinformation and the miscommunication. I'm I'm sure I saw some officers that didn't look too happy to be instructing folks the way that they had to or that they did. Uh, same way with the uh, the misinformation spread by mainstream media. But to your point about the the blockades that were resolve, so to speak, before the Emergencies Act was, was invoked. I mean, again, just for the people in the back, it's almost like it wasn't necessary, right? <laughs> it's almost like it wasn't necessary. It's, it's almost like we're just repeating ourselves every day. You know, I'm going to I'm gonna try and, and open with a different dialogue tomorrow. Not, you know, it's the same dialogue every day, folks. So I'm going to try and be more creative tomorrow. Yeah, well, the issue is that it is. We're, hear <laughs> we're hearing the same evidence every single day. We're hearing evidence <sighs> that backed what was shown the day before. And then the day before that, we heard evidence that that back what was said the day prior to that. Yeah. And it just spirals the whole way. I think, yeah, I'm not sure Justin True likes the inquiry, likes, likes what's happening a lot. I would love to be a fly on the wall in one of his cabinets meeting him and Omar Al-Jabra <laughs> talking about how they can spin the narrative and try to make it seem like they're still the good guys. All right, guys, we've been on for an hour now. I hope that you're not too tired of hearing us. Let's take a look at some of the uh, some of the um, the chats that we that we received throughout the live stream. If you have any, at Annalisa, do you want to read it? Sure, Annalisa, nineteen sixty four for ten dollars. Thank you so much for your donation, Annalisa. Um, says great recap tonight. Plus, I need to redeem myself and send a big shout out to William. You manly man, hello. Oh, that's right. Because yeah. yeah. So for the people that didn't follow our recent <laughs> live stream, thank you, Annalisa. Um, I was misgendered last live stream. I was misgendered. It really hurt my feeling. Someone said that I was a lady. That's not so. what happened. Sheila and I, the other night, were on the live stream. And before William came on, Annalisa sent in a comment addressing us ladies. And at that time, we read it. William happened to be sitting there. So you were misgendered. You're, you're all within your manliness. No, you're, you're great. You're good. I'll do a complaint of using a bill to 16 to back, back <laughs> myself off. You're going to prison, Annalisa. All right. Do we have any, any more chats? Well, perfect. Thank you, Olivia. Thank you, Efron, for your hard work tonight. Um, yeah, I mentioned you, our national drama mm -hmm. teacher earlier. We didn't have time to watch some of the clips from him today, but we will see a lot more from him tomorrow. I can promise I'll make sure we touch on what he said um, throughout the day because he always says something more ridiculous every day. It's, it's a drama teacher. You, can, you never know what to expect. Uh, thank you so much for your time, Celine. Thank you so much, Alan, for joining us today. Thank you, Keith, who's in the background still. Thank you, Eva, who can hear me. <laughs> 
from the skies. I know she can hear me. Uh, once again, rebelnewslive.com. If you want to be able to meet all of us, your favorite Rebel News reporters, you can go to rebelnewslive.com and there you will be able to buy your tickets. I'm sure the executive team is going to be happy with me um, <clears throat> advertising rebelnewslive.com. All right. Thank you, everyone, for, for joining us tonight. Um, see you tomorrow. What are you afraid will come from testifying at that inquiry? Well, I've, I've said it. This is a federal, a federal inquiry based on the federal government calling for the Emergency Act. This is a federal issue. We've had our, our senior public service go there, the deputy. We've had the commissioner of the OPP there. This was under the police. I don't direct the police. This is something that falls under the police. We, well, the OPP sent police officers there and they, they ended it. And so it's a federal government, it's not a provincial government.